Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another Zojo Talk podcast episode. And this time I have with me as special guest, Travis Hill of Zojo. And we're going to be talking a bit about a few things, starting with the latest release of Zojo 2020 release two. Travis, welcome. Hey, Paul. Hey, long time no talk. Uh, yeah, well, I, I guess we, well, we talk all the time. <laughs> Yeah, we do. So speaking of things we were talking about all the time, uh, 2020 R2 came out. And yeah, that was so nice to get that shipped. That was nice. And it was it was also nice that we kind of turned that around pretty quickly, uh, especially after how long R1 ended up uh, taking. But this was almost like three months to the day, really. Um, yeah, when it had so many features that we'd been working on as a team for quite a while, they just kind of all came together in 2020 R2. Right, which is as Travis is alluding to, is we tend to be working on stuff all the time that isn't necessarily slated for the next immediate release. So a lot of things that ended up in R2 had been in development for quite some time during R1, during releases prior to R1, and they kind of sit right. off to the side, you know, in other uh, branches of our source control system, and they get to, you know all packaged up together when we decide when uh, we want to put them in what particular release. So the big thing that ended up in this release that was ongoing for quite a while was the new iOS API 2.0. Yeah, that yeah. was huge. That was huge. <laughs> that that was a lot of months. Actually, you might be able to round that estimate up to uh, more than a year of work on that. Uh, yeah, in total, I'm sure. Yeah. Because there were so many different, I mean, controls, methods, classes that we brought over to iOS that now really kind of make it uh, sync up with the, the rest of the platform. So that feels really good to have out there. Right. And it all it all started with the uh, the ability for us to ensure that we could actually properly get string and variant operational on iOS. And then once those pieces were in place, then it was all the work that Travis was just talking about. We're getting everything else updated to use that stuff or tweaked or whatnot. Right. And you played a big part in that. There were just so many moving parts and so many different methods and classes that we, we had to have documents tracking, you know, which things were where and figuring out what we needed to add and when. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was it definitely, a big project. It definitely was a lot of a lot of stuff to keep track of and update and test with. I we have about eighty, eighty to ninety projects, iOS projects that we include with Zojo. And I had to go through those probably more than once and update them. Yeah, to, oh yeah, a couple times. <laughs> to make sure that they were working with the new API and uh, and just to test out some of the new API stuff and then test out the new features and test out converting projects from the old uh, classes to the new classes and all that stuff. So a lot of work was done there. And then, of course, updating things as we, we found issues, fixing bugs um, right. that were in there. <laughs> that we uh, came across that we were able to better address now. And then in addition to just those changes, adding new features. So uh, one of the big new features was uh, something that Greg added, uh, which was iOS notifications. Right. Yeah. Uh, people have been wanting those for quite a while. <laughs> and it's nice to have them just directly in the product because we saw some people trying to do declares and things and was just a, a bit more difficult than it should have been. And now it's baked right into the framework. Yeah, baked in and, uh, you know, relatively easy to set up, uh, especially if you've ever looked at the actual Apple Docs for how to hook up all this notification stuff. It is quite complex. I, I certainly have been on plenty of uh, calls with Greg where he was ranting about something that Apple <laughs> had, had done that we had yes. to figure out how to hook up. Uh, but it is good to see that you got your local and remote notifications among many other things and just a, a small handful of classes you really have to work through to uh, to set all that up. So I've already seen right. people on the forum posting how well it's been working. So that's really good to see uh, when a new feature gets adopted. Yeah, and I the... think we actually got um, one or two apps built with Zojo and notifications that are, if they haven't hit the app store yet, they're coming soon. And it's nice to see that. Yep. Yeah. iOS definitely had a lot of uh, stuff added. The, of course, the new controls and the new data types and the new, the new features. You know, I mentioned the notifications. Uh, there were other stuff like you can now have your Zojo apps handle a URL scheme. 
So if you have a custom URL, your Zojo app can respond to it. Uh, you can have a menu on the uh, kind of the home screen. You can long press the right. icon and you can get a menu that pops up and then the user can choose something from the menu and then you can get what they chose when your app is kicked off and then you can route your app to a different screen or something like that. Uh, there are other features for uh, showing badges. Um, but the other cool thing is that much there's now much, much more feature parity on iOS with yes, desktop. and actually, I think that's probably my favorite thing overall. Is while it may sound boring to some people, the fact that you know we have uh, encode and decode base sixty four methods, right? Well, those weren't a part of iOS, and now they just work. It's uh, it's nice to have so many pieces of the framework where you can just share code now from desktop to iOS without having to think about it. Yeah, we were able to pull in a lot of the existing framework and get it ready for iOS. So like Travis mentioned, that, that URL stuff works. You have access to URL connection. Um, what are some of the other ones? Regex, uh, XML document. Oh, yeah. Yep. Uh, there's just it's too much stuff to really list. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it, it's in the triple digits of things that got added to iOS, literally. But the, the biggest thing overall is just the fact that now most of those things in the framework that you're used to seeing on desktop are just available to you in iOS, and it's really nice to have. And uh, the last big thing I'll mention regarding iOS before we move on to the next thing is uh, plugins now work. Yes, so, it has been a big request from both the you know people who author the plugins and users who want to be able to install uh, plugins, and you can do that now. So in addition to all the new stuff we've added to iOS, you'll have the ability to throw some plugins in there and have access to even more iOS stuff. Right, so, because now it's wide open to the third-party market, which has always been supportive of Zojo. So it's nice that they're able to extend what we offer on iOS now as well. And let's transition from iOS to the new support that Zojo has for the new Apple computers, the new Macs that use the M1 chips. The, oh, yeah, the, the M1 chips. Apple Silicon. Um, yeah, that was something a, a lot of people were saying, hey, we're pleasantly surprised that you were right there, that I could build a universal binary that supported these. And the reason we were able to do that that quickly is, well, number one, as soon as Apple announced it, we were on top of it, got our uh, developer kits and just started working on getting our own framework up and online as soon as we could. And as I mentioned before, we already had our compiler working outputting uh, ARM64 instructions uh, for iOS. So uh, kind of merging those pieces together, the framework and the compiler, we were able to uh, deliver it uh, right along Apple as they shipped their first products. Right. And I think it helped too that, you know, we weren't really blindsided by this. I mean, everybody no. and their mother-in-law was expecting Apple to do this at some point. So every summer we'd be like, is this the year this is going to happen? And we're going to have to, you know, finish right. up. We'd tune in and probably, I don't know, last three WWDCs or so, we you know we knew it was coming, we just didn't know which one. And so we would wait, is this it? Is this it? Right, and, yeah. so we always had a few sure. things, you know, ready to go, you know, that would, you know, like, all right, this could be the one. And then we like, then when they didn't announce it like last year, we were like, all right, phew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things that it, uh, a lot of Apple announcements for us at Sojo are both, you know, exciting and nerve wracking because we're, we're excited about the new feature. And then sometimes that means, well, we've got some work to do to implement those features in Zojo and off we go. <laughs> but as is typically the case with these sort of transitions, you know, going from PowerPC to Intel back in the day, that was like 2005 or so. Um, and then going from 32 bit to 64 bit, there's not a lot that, you know, you as a Zojo uh, user need to worry about. You just go over to your Mac OS build settings go to the architecture property, and there'll be an entry there for Intel 64-bit. That's what you usually had. And now there's two more. There's one for Universal, and there's one for ARM 64-bit. And most of the time, you're probably just going to want to check Universal. Yeah, because that just works at full speed on both Intel and Apple Silicon Macs. 
right? And then you build, and there you go. You've got yourself a universal app that'll run on the M1 Max, which we'll be talking a little bit more about later, but uh, uh, which, you know, we're, we're pretty excited about those too. But yeah, it is... And our uh, third parties have been pretty good about updating support for Apple Silicon and their plugins as well, and there are more on the way from them, but uh, they, they've been really on the ball too. So it's made it a pretty easy transition for most of our, our users, I think. Right, and that that is important for you to uh, realize. You you your plugins will need to be updated so that they have you know ARM components yes. in them. Otherwise, they, you won't be able to use them. But the other good thing is that your your Zojo apps, even if you aren't able to rebuild them as you know Universal or, or ARM just yet, run very well in the Rosetta Two emulator. So that is always a, a fallback option too. Yeah. All right. Uh, the other. Not the other, but another, another big, a big feature. <laughs> there are many, many things in 2020 R2. That was in 2020 R2 is uh, something we demonstrated in the uh, the XDC videos we did in the early spring uh, when the conference itself was canceled. We put some uh, videos online, and one of the features we demonstrated was something called Worker, and uh, that is now available on in R2. And what a worker is, is something people have been asking about for many years, which is the essentially the ability for you to have uh, some code that can run across multiple CPU cores. Normally, your Zojo apps run on just a single CPU core, which is limiting if you've got something that requires, you know, a fair amount of uh, computing to do. Right. And, uh, and, you know, computers these days have generally quite a few CPU cores, so it's nice to be able to take <laughs> advantage of them. So what Worker yeah. gives you is a class uh, called Worker. Funny name. Uh, it matches uh, <laughs> kind of what it does. But you, you put this class in your project, you get some events, and the primary event being something called Job Run. And the code you put in Job Run will essentially get um, siphoned off so that it can run on its own CPU core. And as many as you decide, you have some settings you can tweak as to you know how many CPU cores you want to use and that sort of thing. And then that'll get spawned off, and your code will uh, be allowed to run on more than one CPU core and get the performance gains associated with that. Uh, we have a couple example projects that are included with Zojo that show how you can uh, get some speed from that. Uh, my, my favorite one is the one I've been using for many years, the, the horribly bad word counter example. That uh, Oh, yeah. We've, we've shipped variations of that for quite a while, I think. Right, right. <laughs> People always tell me when they look at that, they're like, this is a brain-dead way to calculate words <laughs> or count words. And I'm like, well, yeah, that kind of was the point. I wanted a super slow way to count words and then to see how that is sped up by using more cores. So the idea right. is how does a chorus speed it up, not how do you speed up the algorithm. Um <laughs> But anyway, this sort of thing goes from about 12 seconds when it tries to count words on our four sample files on a single core to down to about three to four seconds when you spin it off to running on four cores. And this yeah. is not a big, you know, 12 seconds in the first place isn't that long of a time. So just to cut it down a third on this quick little example is pretty neat. And if you had something that was chugging a little more seriously... You, you definitely get some benefit. So, yeah, yeah, and that's really just reusing the same logic, just putting it inside of a worker. Right, yeah. The, there was a class that does the horrible word counting, and <laughs> the same <laughs> right? class is used in the worker. It's just spreading the load. But uh, it would, we've been hearing and seeing some people in the forum, again, talking about how they're using this to a good effect. So we look forward to that. And, you know, as with all of these things, they, they're not just, you know, released in isolation, never to be touched again. Uh, and Worker will be continued to be tweaked. And uh, and we do have some uh, plans to also move it out. Right now it's desktop only, but we do see that it would be useful with web and even within console apps. So uh, we have plans to figure out how to get it hooked up in there as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and speaking of uh, desktop things... Um, we added a couple new desktop controls that have been asked about for quite a while, frankly. Uh, oh, date, yeah. Some date, of our top requests, yeah, actually, over yeah. the years. Uh, a date time picker and a search field, uh, which, you know, there are always ways to make your own versions of those things, of course, so just pretty flexible. But it's nice to have some built-in ones that use, you know, OS 
standard look and feel and you know work across you and know, they're right on your library when you open zojo you don't have to think about it <laughs> yeah i mean there's not too much to say about these that like travis says they're in the library just drag them over and use them uh the daytime picker lets you pick a date or a time as it might you might get uh you can control that uh you know you should have it show a calendar and just click on a date or something like that and you got events so you can get back what the user actually picked that sort of thing and then the search field is very similar. Uh, it looks like a text field, but it has the extra controls for, you know, showing uh, search history, uh, clearing the field, right. um, that sort of stuff. Um, so two handy things that are probably useful in just about any app you're making. So definitely check them out. Yeah. Yeah. And we, would, we did want to point out that uh, we do have a point release in the works for 2020 R2 that should be out pretty soon, you know, maybe shortly yeah, after this podcast. Yeah, R2.1 will probably be out shortly after this podcast is released. Yeah, that's what I'm going to say, <laughs> you know, around that time. Uh, certainly, you know, sometime this month. And, uh, yeah. you know, like with any big release, there's a lot of moving parts, and sometimes there's a few things we need to correct after the fact. So we try to jump on that quickly so that you guys all have something stable that you can use and work with and build the apps that you need yep uh so 2020 r2 uh we're pretty happy with it um so yeah far, one of our biggest feature releases that we've done i mean it had a lot of stuff in it that we just covered <laughs> yeah a lot of stuff i mean like we only touched on some of the things definitely you know grab a download of it uh go through the release notes there's like 230 items on it so you know it's a nice you know nice evening read uh, you know, go. Yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> Get back, have a drink, and just go pour through. through. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, I mentioned earlier we want to talk about this, and uh, I'm going to bring it up again. But uh, the Apple Macs that are using the M1 chips, those were announced back at WWDC this summer, and Apple said coming in the, I guess before the end of the year is what they had said. Right. And uh, and then November rolled around, and they uh, they had an announcement in the middle of November, and they shipped uh, just before Thanksgiving, I guess, here in the U.S. Yeah, yeah. And you know their their little meeting they did, the little video that they posted was it was kind of amazing when you heard them talk about the performance boosts. A little bit unbelievable, also at the same time when they're talking about oh, yeah, they're... And, and their charts were you know relative performance, so it was a little tough to gauge because they didn't specify exactly which things they were comparing against. But all of their arrows showed well. Of course, M1 is faster. M1 is better. Right, and it, people that had it that one of the developer transition kits. You know, we had a couple of those. I mean, we were all really pretty cautiously optimistic. Those were working well, and we're using an older Yeah, and that was chip. just with an, an iPad chip, like you right. said. So we were all pretty cautiously optimistic, but others were like, yeah, there's no way Apple's just, you know, doing marketing <laughs> speak here. There's no way this is going to work the way they said. And then the machines started arriving, and holy cow, these things worked the way they said or better. <laughs> Right. Well, and you and I talked about this for uh, quite a while before they actually shipped. I remember kind of half joking with you about how the best case scenario for these new M1 Macs would be if they were fast enough that through Rosetta translation, your Intel apps would run at the same speed as a previous model Mac or faster, but we really didn't think that was possible. Well, now I'm sitting here with a MacBook Pro 13-inch M1, and lo and behold, that's actually been the case. I haven't run into even an Intel app that runs slower, and many of them actually run faster just because of the M1. And that's through Rosetta Translation, which is just amazing. That is amazing. And it's it's doubly amazing that the only Macs they made available right now are all the low-end models. Uh, right. That, that most developer types don't really want. <laughs> yeah, well, and they, they might think they don't want them, but I do have to say, you know, the MacBook Pro 13 has long been one of my favorite Macs that Apple has made because it's really portable, it's really light, but it's always uh, been able to actually, you know, you could always do real work on it. Plug it into an external display as a workstation, take it with you, it's always about three pounds. Um, and with the M1 in it, 
this M1 quote unquote low end uh, MacBook Pro 13 inch on just about everything I've thrown at it is beating my previous MacBook Pro 13 inch, which was the high end Intel 10th gen version, uh -huh. which is just amazing. So you can imagine what's going to happen is they put out uh, higher end MacBook Pros and other Macs with even faster uh, Apple Silicon. It's it's going to be pretty cool, I think. Yeah, it's just, I mean, I keep watching YouTube videos and people testing these things. And, you know, in particular, I like to focus on the ones where they actually show, you know, them using tools more similar to development tools like Xcode or something rather than right. all, the, all the video editing stuff that, you know, I don't really use that sort of thing, so I don't care. But when they show, yeah, an M1 MacBook Pro using Xcode can build, you know, WebKit faster than an iMac Pro, and you're just like, what? <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I, I think it surprised a lot of people even here at Zojo that currently my main Mac now is that MacBook Pro 13 inch M1 plugged into an external display. And I would not have thought that would have been possible until I actually had it in my hands. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. The other thing I really like about it that I think a lot of people don't appreciate is the fact that I can be doing a ton of stuff on it with it sitting in my lap and it doesn't get too hot. And that's something we've just gotten used to with a lot of laptops is, well, if you really push them, you're going to have to put a tray over your legs or something, you know, just so it doesn't like get way too hot or burn you. Well, these M1 Macs, you can throw a whole bunch of stuff at them. I, I think I've heard the fan on this once, <laughs> which is amazing given what I do, because I'll have multiple copies of Zojo open and Xcode open and all sorts of things. But they're very, very quiet, and they're very, very cool. Yeah, I have, looking right now, I have three versions of Zojo running on my Mac Mini. I'm not really a laptop guy. I have a Mac Mini, uh, one of the decked-out ones. And uh, I've heard my fan today multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> it's not on right now as we do this podcast, but it was on earlier today. No. Yeah, I'll, I'll bet when they introduce you know some other M1 Minis that you might consider uh, – moving over or whatever they call the, you know, the higher end uh, Apple Silicon. Right. Yeah. Whatever they, they call their little, you know, desktop uh, beefier system. The, the Mac mini that came out is enticing for me, uh, believe me. But with the 16 gig RAM limit, I'm like, yeah, I don't want to get that because I tend to keep my computers a little longer. And that seems like that might be a limiting factor. Maybe not today, but, you know, in a couple of years. Right. So I'm like, eh. Yeah, and I'll bet the next ones come with more, you know, at least 32, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, all the videos I've watched where people doing the heavy video editing and whatnot are saying that 16 gigs fine. This thing is not even, you know, hiccuping, even with such little RAM compared to what people normally use. Well, and that's been my experience too. Multiple Zojos, Xcode, you know, web browsers, et cetera, it's actually been fine with the 16, which is honestly surprising to me, but I'm happy. Yeah, and you know, and along with all that, the battery life that the new laptops are purporting to get is also impressive. I do have a laptop. I got an old MacBook Air that is kind of like you know, my, my backup backup that I use on occasion for things. And that thing now gets, you know, maybe three hours of battery. <laughs> <laughs> right. And uh, these new ones are like, yeah, 15 hours, not really a big deal. You'd probably go more depending on what you're doing. And I'm like, what? Yeah. When I used to be, uh, just as a kind of a random anecdote, I would never build the Zojo frameworks if I wasn't plugged in, just because, I mean, we have thousands upon thousands of lines of code. I mean, it's a huge project um, to build, and it's just not something you typically do on battery power on a laptop. Well, uh, I just tried that the other day. And I think it took, you know, 1% off of my battery life, <laughs> which was pretty amazing compared to the 10, 20% hit it would usually give and um, building something so massive on a tiny little machine. But, right. Yeah, and cool. uh, yeah, so the M1s, uh, you know, they look uh, just kind of amazing. I haven't not personally used one myself yet. I haven't uh, dared pop into the Apple store around here to play with one. Although I've been, <laughs> right. I've, I've been checking the stock on the website. It does look like the the 16 gig models are um, unavailable everywhere. You got to order it and wait like a month before you can get anything. Yeah. 16 gig. 
of RAM. Well, but, and since I knew I wanted to try mine, the way I got mine was just right after the announcement. I thought, okay, I want the higher end MacBook Pro 13 because I thought, you know, maybe that could work and it might be able to replace my uh, in high end Intel. But I was skeptical. So I thought, well, I'll just put in the order now because at least I'll, you know, be in line to get one and then right. I'll compare, see if I return it or keep it. But I decided to keep it. It's been great. Yeah, the only real downside that people have been complaining about, other than the, the maybe the lower RAM ceiling that may not even be a problem, is the fact that you can't virtualize anything on it just yet. Uh, in particular, yeah. Well, and actually, that's starting to not be true. <laughs> I've seen that. Yeah, I've seen more posts of you know. Granted, yeah, there's no um, product yet, but people are starting no, to figure things out. Right. So you know, there, there's an open source project called QEMU that I'm sure you've heard of, particularly as a retro enthusiast that lets you emulate and virtualize, you know, different uh, CPU types. And uh, they, they've they actually now updated that to work on uh, these new Apple Silicon ARM Macs. And so people have brought up Linux and Windows through QEMU, and it's actually worked quite well. In fact, I think there was some video showing that uh, Windows 10 for ARM ran better on an M1 through QEMU virtualization than a Surface Pro, uh, which <laughs> it's also pretty impressive because Service Pro is Microsoft's flagship ARM product. Right. You'd think they'd have it tuned for that. Uh, but yeah, I've started to see some videos around that, which is certainly encouraging. Um, and but I do think that the uh, heavy hitters like Parallels and VMware, you know, that in a couple months they'll be shipping updates to their products, and that's when it'll become more mainstream virtualizing on. Apple Silicon. <laughs> right. Well, as I, I told Travis earlier today, he said, luckily for me, I've now reached a point where I don't care because I now have separate PCs set up for Windows and Linux that I can just remote right. into. I got uh, some smaller, low-end machines for a good deal, and they're just sitting off on the side here in my office, so I could just remote into them, so I don't need to actually virtualize anymore, it doesn't look like. Um, which even yeah, on that's my actually what I... What I'm typically doing now as well, um, in fact, someone was asking me, like, well, how do you do Windows and Linux then on your uh, M1 Mac? Well, I have remote desktop windows open that are going to, uh, similar to yours, a Windows machine and then a Linux instance, and away I go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I still have, like, Fusion and, well, Parallels I still have, although I think my license expires in a couple of days. But those are great and kind of convenient, but they do take a pretty big hit, you know, because you want to assign them, you know, like four cores probably. And, you know, I've got a six-core a Mac, so, you know, all of a sudden the Mac, if I'm trying to do something heavy, is going to be fighting a little bit with one of the VMs. And there's times when right. I'm running, like, two or three VMs at once. And, <laughs> and if you only give the VM one or two cores, it's not, like, a real machine and right yeah. yeah my and that's what's cool is my real machines that aren't very high end really are way faster than either of the vms no matter how much uh, you know stuff i give them right uh so yeah that that's uh that's exciting to see i i definitely am eager to see what apple um is able to push out for you know real desktop level stuff you know like another high-end mac mini replacement or even the imax um, I'd be very eager to see that because uh, these are... Yeah, I think next year will be really interesting with Apple introducing updates to the, a lot of the rest of their line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, uh, it'll be interesting to see how the rest of the computer industry responds too because, uh, you know, regular PCs running Windows from Dell or whomever are going to, you know, have some different performance numbers for comparison. And I wonder how they're going to, you know, talk those through <laughs> but yeah it, it's it, all of these architecture transitions and you know as you said we've been through several of them i mean they're they're always interesting you know technically and just as you know that any kind of computing hobbyists track these transitions as well because they can deliver interesting things like you know as we've discussed levels of performance that otherwise weren't possible before <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, you know, us being, you know, uber nerds, I think we tend to, you know, 
ogle over this a little more than you know the average person but you know, absolutely it, it's definitely fascinating and the other thing i do find the memory thing to be fascinating too because i was definitely super concerned that the memory numbers looked low to me i mean i've got 64 gig on my mac mini right now and i'm like oh yeah that's so, quite a lot <laughs> and like 16 is a maximum that doesn't seem like enough and then but apple was touting this unified memory architecture that everyone says is super, super fast. And the built-in graphics seem to be very good for built-in graphics. And uh, I was like, unified memory architecture. That takes me back, you know, going back to like the 80s when, you know, you had computers like the Amiga or something like that. They had they had something that was like that, where the, you had the, the memory was split between what the graphics cards could talk to and what the CPU could talk to. And it was kind of a reverse situation as to what Apple has here. But it's just funny right. how there were different types of memory back then. And we may end up with something like that, where Apple keeps, say, 16 gig as the unified memory. And then there's some additional RAM that's accessible that isn't unified but it's, you can still use i don't know that's why i'm so eager to see what they come up with. yeah who knows <laughs> the future is interesting for sure <laughs> yep yep definitely all right so uh one thing that i want to mention in closing because uh, people tend to ask about it is uh you know what's next on the plate and you know when's android coming everyone always asks about that sort of thing <laughs> yeah and uh, you know we don't talk about when something's coming coming you all know this uh you know and you know what we're working on you can go to our roadmap go to docs.zojo.com slash roadmap bring up the roadmap you can see what it is we're working on and when we'll push it out is when we are comfortable and think it's ready so we're not going to really say when android is coming however we are going to say that you got a very big teaser as to what Android will have. In, yeah, in, inside of 2020 R2. In 2020 R2, you know, the iOS stuff, all the classes now start with mobile. And uh, that is because many, many of those are going to be shared with Android as far as capabilities and naming and all that good stuff. Uh, yeah. So you kind of got a teaser there as to where we're headed with Android. Uh, and when it's ready for, you know, sharing with people, you can believe we'll be making a lot of noise. So you won't, oh, yeah. you won't miss out. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll be very excited. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'll get the word. The word will be out there. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, and with that, I think we're going to wrap up here. I uh, want to uh, hope everyone has a good uh, holiday season, a good uh, winter solstice as it is. Yes. Uh, yes. Travis, thank you for uh, being on the podcast today. And thank you, Paul. This was fun. All right. Have a great day, everyone.